I remember this one client who we met at a startup event. Okay, like, hey, come to the, the office and you know we'll take you to the, the Harbour View office and um, ask you about your legal problems. Probably been to these places. You press a button and someone comes and takes your order and brings coffee yep. in. <laughs> and then this guy was like, this is really nice, but am I paying for all this? <laughs> and that's when we were like, this market doesn't need any of this flashy stuff. They want something quick, simple, online. And I think that's where the idea of Sprint Mall came from. Before we get started on today's episode, we would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which this podcast is recorded, the land of the Darug people. We would like to acknowledge and pay respects to our elders past and present and the next generation coming through. Now, on to today's episode. Welcome to the Level Asian Podcast. Today, we're joined by Alex and Tomo, the founders of Sprint Law, a new age law firm in Australia. In this episode, we'll be exploring Alex and Tomo's unique backgrounds and how they came together to create Sprint Law. We delve into their first experiences working at a law firm, the early days of Sprint Law, and how they utilize technology to nurture clients instead of following the traditional law pathway. We also discuss the importance of maintaining a strong business relationship, their goals for the future of Sprint Law, and Alex and Tomo also share some valuable advice for aspiring lawyers. Enjoy the episode. I'll sort of give some context because, you know, we're going to start the uh, the episode, but... Um, yeah, we were just saying, obviously, before the recording that, um, you know, you guys probably have some funny stories about, like, quitting. Um... And, you know, going out and obviously starting up Sprint Law and that sort of stuff. So, Alex, do you want to sort of start on how your parents' reaction was when you when you told them that you were uh, yeah. leaving to start your own thing? I, I guess it was the, the first time I ever had to do a pitch as a founder <laughs> was to, to your parents. And both of my parents are, um, are sort of, neither of them are entrepreneurial. Both of them are like a- academic background, worked in the public sector, you know, did, did something for a long time, got mm. really good at it. Uh, and so, the concept, and, you know, I was working uh, like Tomo as well in a, nice prestigious law firm with a law degree and ticking the boxes and really was you know in the scheme of things i mean we were sort of two and a half years or something post qualification so pretty early days i think Mm. they assumed i would do this for a while before i did anything crazy i just remember um telling my parents are thinking of leaving and starting this law company um and my my mum was super supportive she's just like oh yeah go do it like i think probably in her mind had some sort of frustrated uh, entrepreneurial spirit that she never never did anything and so she was supportive my dad was like uh you're gonna start a law firm you're not even 30 like <laughs> how old were you at yeah, the time i think we were 27 were yeah we? 27 okay. he's like you just started he's like you don't know anything <laughs> and i was like oh I mean, he was right he, we didn't know anything <laughs> he, was, he was more right than than we knew um but yeah, I just, I gave him the pitch and, and, and I reckon that sort of formed some of the pitch ideas we ended up having later because he was grilling, grilling me hard. He's like, well, why now? Why can't you wait two years? What? Just get a bit more experience. Yeah, it's like right. that song, um, uh, uh, Father and Son by Cat Stevens, where there's like a father and a son talking. I don't know if you guys know that song, but the father is basically like, son, just wait a bit. And the son's like, I got to do it now. And the father's like, I'm wise. Anyway, it was very much like that. He's like, just you're tw- in your twenties, you just don't know anything. And eventually I was just like, now's the time. If we don't do it now, someone else will. We need to do it. We've got energy. We're going to have a different way of thinking, blah, blah, blah. And eventually I sort of won him over. And I think now after five, six years, he's shut up a bit, but it took time. Yeah. So it's not because I know some people who came out of like making that leap and their parents were like super against Mm -hmm. it, but now they're Mm -hmm. like their biggest supporters. So you're saying like your dad still right now is like, he's like, oh, okay, you're doing all right. Yeah. I think over time, I mean- I use him as pitch practice because he's 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 <laughs> he's gonna grill, right? So every yeah. time I see him, I'm just getting better at the pitch, and I think I've pitched to him enough times where he's a pretty big supporter. So it's really good, like, yeah. to have a dad that you know scrutinizes everything you do and in a very smart way. I yeah. assume, right? So yeah. where, where does he come from? Like so I mean, he's background? he's it's interesting because he's got a so he's a professor of engineering and previously statistics. So he's like a sort of quantitative background and law unlike, you know, accounting is is very not quantitative traditionally. Mm. Mm. Um, and Tomo and I, I think both are definitely more quantitative thinkers than your average lawyer. But yeah, a lot of what he's doing is grilling the numbers and grilling the business model and grilling the data things that we're it's saying we're doing and all this stuff and really just asking hard numbers-based questions, which I think really helped the business model a lot, yeah. Mm. And then Tomo, uh, do you have the same reaction or what was that like with the uh, the parents? Yeah, my parents have always been pretty chill um i know there's a stereotype of asian parenting but um i definitely didn't have that growing up and so 
yeah, I was like, this is what I'm going to do. And they're like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> Good on you. Um, yeah. yeah, that that was, my, I don't have any sort of. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I was curious <laughs> because obviously everyone's got different yeah. um, sort of backgrounds. But if we sort of wind it back, because obviously we, I'm sure people want to know also is like how you guys met and sort of where the whole relationship started as well. So you guys met each other sort of early days in your career. You guys want to, I don't know who yeah. wants to go first. But, um, uh, I mean, we met, um, we were at a law firm. We did, the, you know, the the clerkship thing. I don't know if you know, it's like an internship where you, um, yeah, work over summer and um, it's like in your second last year of uni. So um, we, we were in the same cohort. We, we met then um, and yeah, we just became friends. Um, you know, it was kind of like a very different environment to mm. what we were used to. It was like very corporate. Traditional like, type? Yeah, or? traditional. And, you know, we both went to like a selective school, that yep. kind of background. And a lot of people there were like from private schools and, you know, that, that, that kind of cultural shock. So I think we bonded over that. And also, you know, we were both, we both had a, like a technology interest or background. Um, and we were like, this place does not use any tech. <laughs> um, we can clearly do things much more efficiently and, and better. And I think that's how we bonded. Yeah. Did you join um, thinking you're always going to be lawyers? Did you have a love and like for for being illegal for example i i enjoy like law as a as a discipline like an academically mm. um i never really being a lawyer was never a, a big identity but I, I find like quite interesting like intellectually yeah yeah i don't like you but. yeah i mean i i reckon i was i didn't really i knew so much less than even law students i speak to now about what being a lawyer was i just mm. found myself with a law degree for some reason and then oh, there's a law firm thing. I should try that and work out what this thing is. But pretty quickly when I started working, I was like, don't think I want to do this for my whole career. But I was like, I want to learn the skills and, and do a couple of years. I think pretty early on, I knew I, did, I didn't want to do it long term, but definitely not growing up. Like some people growing up, they're like, I want to be a lawyer. That's all I want to do. Hmm. Um, and yeah. I find similar. that part fascinating. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, the part where, uh, yeah, you can be a lawyer and you can you can still love law. Yes. But you don't have to always jump into the, the traditional ways, like get become a lawyer, start uh, like, you know, work your way do up. Do your time. Do yeah. your time. Whereas you can, you love tech. And when we first met, mm. we talked about tech. That's all we talked about. Yeah, we didn't talk about law at all. Yeah, we didn't talk about law. We didn't talk about accounting. It was just about the tech and the, how we're starting a business yeah. and doing it together, which was really, really fun for me. And I like, yeah, that's... That's what I find very interesting on the, the new generation that's doing this stuff. For and, sure. and one thing I wanted to point out is it's a massive honor to have you guys here because like it's, you don't really see many people doing things like this in our age. Mm. And obviously uh, people of color starting a service-based um, professional firm mm. and doing things different as well. So yeah. it's to me, it's just it's just super proud moment. Mm. Well, I think you guys can probably share a little bit about like sort of where Sprint Law is at now. Um, but I think before we get into that, because I think we're jumping around a little bit all over the place. But maybe if I should sort of start with Alex first, right at the beginning, we're talking like obviously growing up, right? Because I think it's always of interest to people. Um, can you tell us a bit about like sort of what growing up was like, um, where you grew up, what family life was like in school? I moved here when I was three and a half and just grew up in Sydney. Yep. Um, I have a mother who's of Indian descent and then my dad is Australian, kind of Ukrainian, Russian, Jewish descent. But um, they met in Australia originally, but then really got together in America and we were academics oh. there for 25 years. And then, so I was born there, have a US passport, but then grew up um, kind of with this weird, you know, um, I guess cultural background in, in Australia. I mean, my dad is, Aussie, has an Aussie accent, so um, an element of that, um, but then had lived in America for 20 years. My brother had an American accent, he's older than me. And they, when I was growing up, there was a lot of talk about the US, which is kind of interesting. So there's a weird mm. part of US culture in my upbringing, but, um, but grew up in the northern part of Sydney and went to public school, selective school, um, uh, university, and, and, and kind of that's, that's how it all played out. And then um, ended up doing law just, I mean, I wasn't even really into law growing up, particularly as I mentioned, but more, um, I was a technology dude. Like I was mm. just in my room playing on my computer, gaming or like trying to build things. And only when I was about 16 or 17, did I get interested in law and then ended up studying law just cause I got good marks and that's kind of what you did. So it was yeah, very accidental journey to, mm. to where we ended up sort of meeting. Okay, and then you, Tomo? Yeah, so starting at the beginning, um, I was born in Tokyo um, to 
two Japanese parents, um, and I was one one year old when when they moved over here. Um, actually, they they they'd been in um, Australia before I was born for a few years as well. So um, in the in the mid eighties, they they'd come here. So I think yeah, for intensive purposes, you know, I'm kind of like a second generation Australian. Um, and then yeah, we we grew up in um, uh, yeah Sydney, the northern suburbs, and then. Kind of similar background, actually. We went to you know public school, selective school, went to uni, um, and studied law. And I suppose, yeah, I the reason why I chose law in high school, I was really interested in um, history, economics. They were like the, the subjects I liked. And, and I think I spoke to one of my teachers at the time. You know, these are the subjects I enjoy. Um, what what should I do? And and I think she was like. It sounds like you like these kind of structures of society type things. So, <laughs> yeah. law sounds like what you, <laughs> you do if you get the sounds marks. Like yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, and uh, that's kind of why. And I, I never really like never was a thing like being a lawyer wasn't part of. It was it was it wasn't an aim. I think I kind of wanted to learn about it. Yeah. That's how I got into it. But then, once you study law, the the university is kind of they they teach in a way that you kind of have to become a lawyer, which I think is is unfortunate. You know, it's. Law's, law's pretty interesting as, as a subject matter, um, but everyone kind of just becomes a lawyer. But yeah, and so I kind of fell into becoming a yeah. lawyer. And, and then so you yeah. guys, you guys didn't go to the same university. Uh, you were separate, but you did separate, meet when yeah. you did the clerkship and that was like the first time you guys knew each other. Yeah, I guess like we grew up in a similar area. I think we had like, 60 mutual yeah. friends. We're still discovering how many mutual friends we have. So we, we yeah, even, even like last week, I was like, hey, do you know this guy? He's like, yeah, he went to my school. <laughs> like, yeah, there's, there's a lot of that. Like, we, pre we definitely had met or something somewhere. Yeah. Chatswood or something. Yeah. <laughs> Cross <laughs> yeah. like Chatswood Chase somewhere. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> right. um, and, and then, so um, you did, it was a, two and a half years you guys did sort of in that law firm or roughly around about, how long was it that you guys Yeah, were so I actually worked there through uni. Okay, um, yep. Uh, it, was, it was in this team called Legal Technology Services. Um, when I first started, I was putting barcodes on paper so <laughs> it can be scanned by technology. Right. But by the time I left, um, they were using um, some AI tools to help lawyers review documents. So it was, it was kind of a cool, cool gig. Yep. Um, during uni, I was a paralegal in that team. Um, so I did that for about four or five years throughout uni. Mm -hmm. And then on top of that, two and a half. So yeah, I stayed there for almost eight years. And, oh, wow. And yeah, you kind of I was joined there for, halfway. Yeah. yeah, I joined about halfway. So I was there for probably a total of four and a half or five or something. So I met Tomo in the internship clerkship thing, which mm -hmm. you do in your second last year of university. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And then we became friends and then Tomo helped me get a job in that technology team nice. straight after. So I was working there for the last bit at university and then a bit afterwards and then- um, Is that where the frustration of tech came in? <laughs> you know, yeah, this it's, sort of stuff. Or? It's really interesting. Like that team was kind of an in-house tech consulting team where it, it tells lawyers what tech's available and what they should be using. Hmm. And that that was already a battle because um, we've our team had all these new tools and then the lawyers are like, oh, we don't want to use that. Too hard, yeah. And then when we became lawyers, we were kind of on the other side. And that's when we're like, oh, well, these people actually don't use any of these tools. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But is it because the lawyers um, don't want change or is it was it too hard to change? I can kind of, I, I, you know, having done it ourselves, you can you, you have sympathy of why. It, it's, it's not easy yeah. to implement technology to something that's done by humans. You know, it's not like you can turn it on and it works. So I think you need to be quite intentional and, and be um, pretty well thought out about it. Um, and then in a in a traditional law firm, because they the business model is a hourly billing model, there's no incentive to be efficient because you know the more you build, the more the company yeah. makes, right? Yeah. Um, so there's there's all these sort of structural reasons why I think it it doesn't make sense for them to focus on that, and they probably don't need to, to be honest, because. They're, they're highly profitable businesses, <laughs> yeah, as, yeah. as you yeah, know. Pretty profitable, yeah. 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 yeah, and another interesting feature is, I think, um, just the, the culture of the legal industry. I mean, if you think about what lawyers do, so much of the job is about being risk averse and pointing out problems and you know consulting clients mm. and mainly having this kind of pe pessimistic mindset is, is the kind of stereotype of what a lawyer is. And there's obviously many different types of lawyers, some of which don't fit that stereotype, but certainly the industry is much about risk management. 
And when you try and roll out a new system or a new way of doing things or a new tool, you've got a target market that's a knee-jerk reaction is, oh, well, uh, there's risks of doing this and so on and so forth. And so I think it's it's technology adoption in the legal industry is particularly hard. Mm -hmm. um, even the most forward-thinking lawyers, um, you know, even Tomo and I have been trained to think about risks. And even we sometimes, you know, compared to other businesses working with technology, will think a lot more about risks before we do something than, than the average, I think, um, other industry. So I think that could be an element as well. Yeah. Mm. So then um, as you guys were working together, um, it's not like one day you just sit down and go, yep, we're going to start a law firm. So <laughs> were there particular events leading up to it or conversations that you guys had together that you were like, all right, we, we really want to sort of set this up? Because I think a lot of people are um, should know or should be interested in understanding what it takes and what sort of dialogue is required, particularly if you're going into business together. Like I've got a co-founder like Noel and I. Mm. So that dynamic is different to say Davey, who's a sole director, where he just calls the shots and decides yeah. whatever yeah. happens, happens. So um, I know that's a very sort of loaded pre-context, but I guess my question is, is that what sort of discussions made you guys realize you're like, all right, cool, we're going to set up Sprint Law. And we're um, meant for each other yeah, as well. And, yeah, to take with destiny, you know. I mean, I don't know what your memory is, Tom. I remember like from when we first met, um, we had lunch together a lot and probably like a lot of people that even work in corporate places today, you know, you go to lunch and you start going, this is like, this should be done this way and blah, blah. <laughs> but the two of us just had, you know, like years of those conversations but probably um, both having the technology background and both clearly having good chemistry and talking about ideas and how we would do things over a long period of time, um, started to actually develop ideas and concepts, which again, just over a period of time, talking and talking and talking and talking, starts to turn into, oh, well, there's a concept here, there's a model. Um, I remember a particular lunch that we had, um, I remember saying to you like, are we going to do this? Let's do this. Like, like, <laughs> like we got to do Like, I'm like, I'm, I'm keen to do this. Like now, like when we're young and I remember you going, me too. And we were just like, okay. And then we, so there was a day in my mind, maybe you don't remember it that way, where we fully committed from going from lunchtime chats to actually building something, but it definitely was this long lead up period. Yeah. I, I think, yeah, that's kind of my recollection too. The, the firm we were at were quite supportive of um, this startup thing. Like we, we were really into startups. Like this is like 2012, 2013. Mm. Um, and we kind of grew up in that era, like we grew up when Facebook popped up and um, all that, all that kind of stuff. So we were like, that that startup thing was very attractive. And so what we were doing at the time was um, we convinced some of the partners um, who were into tech and who've done sort of IPOs for X startups now unicorns, and said, hey, we 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 know how to speak to these people, our generation who are in startups. Let us go do some um, BD business development. Um, and we'll bring some clients. So we, we started this little startup group. Um, it was two of us and a few other younger lawyers. And mm. um, yeah, the partner was like, yeah, that's cool. As long as you do your seven billable hours and <laughs> um, that's whatever extra, we're very supportive. <laughs> yes. um, but yeah, we, we, we were kind of doing that for a bit and um, we met a lot of people in the startup scene and asking what their legal problems were. And that was a really good training ground because um, we knew that there was a problem that small businesses, startups need legal services, but they find it a headache. You know, the traditional players, the big firms are too expensive, the smaller ones are not good quality and all of them, you know, take time to respond and they're not online, they're old fashioned, all those issues. Mm -hmm. So we kind of got that first customer feedback from, from that experience. Mm -hmm. And there was, I remember this one, one sort of client who we met at a startup event, We're like, hey, come to the, the office and, you know, we'll take you to the where the Harbour View office and um, <laughs> ask you about your legal problems. And then, you know, you've probably been to these places. There's you press a button and someone comes and takes your order and brings coffee. Yep. And, <laughs> <laughs> and then this guy was like, "This is really nice, but am I paying for all this?" <laughs> <laughs> and that's when we were like, "This market doesn't need any of this flashy stuff. They yeah. want something quick, simple, online." Yeah. And I think that's where the idea of Sprint Law came from. Yeah. yeah. So would you say Sprint Law is more of a tech company or more of a law firm? We, we, well, if you look at the current LinkedIn description, we say law slash tech firm, whatever that means. <laughs> yeah. um, I think we're both like, um, like what is a law firm is a philosophical question, but um, ultimately like our customers are small businesses and, and mm. businesses. So we are providing legal services to them, but we use technology uh, for a bunch of purposes. One is to enable higher quality, more cost-effective delivery. So it's an enabling tool to help 
better service those customers and we build our own technology to do that. And the second is we've got increasing amounts of sort of legal softwares and things, again, all targeted at these small businesses. So we provide services and technology and tech enabled services, hence law slash tech, definitely a combination, I think. Um, mm. And, uh, but you know, there is an identity thing that we've, we've, we, we've kind of evolved over the years. Are we gonna be a software business, a services business and, and realize that ultimately we're a business that's trying to have amazing customer experience for small businesses and that requires a few different things. So mm. it's really about them at the end of the day, if that yeah. makes sense. So it doesn't really matter what category you are. Exactly, really. exactly. Um, mm. Cool, I think you had a question about bamboo ceiling. Oh yeah, so, yeah, so um, basically like in the accounting world, we, we experience this in, in, in probably in other industries as well where <laughs> Uh, us uh, people of color or in disadvantaged um, cultures, it's it's harder to move up in the world. Um, and there's an expectation of us like that we got to do our time. And sometimes when we do our time, it just we kind of lose track of where we want to be, and it's hard to get there. Do you guys experience that in in the um, legal world? In yeah, I mean we haven't been in that world for over five years. Mm. Um, I've spoken to friends who are in corporate now. It sounds like it's much better. Um, and maybe even too good where, <laughs> where they promote, actively promote, and maybe that's a good thing, but actively promote um, people from diverse backgrounds. Um, but yeah, when we were there, I mean, yeah, it was, I think definitely, I mean, the, the older, older people at the top um, are obviously sort of, they're from that generation. How can I say this? In a nice way. <laughs> <laughs> Vague, nice way. <laughs> there were little little things that happen from time to time that um, you realize that um, there are little barriers, but it's it's not a, it's not that overt. So it's really hard to yeah, it's subtle. It's it's really hard Very to subtle, say, yeah. like make an issue out of it. Even yeah. look yeah. for me, like it's I've noticed some weird stuff that happened, um, and it's 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 not like. I guess like the way, um, you know, the higher ups think about it, it's just like, oh, um, you know, we can replace these people. It's no big deal. Like, you know, there's a fresh, uh, fresh new graduates that are coming in mm. next year. And I, I, I used, because I used to be a manager at a, um, at a accounting firm and, and, and just, that's just how they treated people rather than actually giving them the, um, the, the, the pathway to get to wherever they want to be. Like, mm. you know, um, once you make it to the top, okay, you're, you're part of this, this club now and for the people under you it's harder for them to get in they don't leave the door open and that's what i kind of realized mm -hmm. um and it's unfortunate I, I, obviously there are some people out there and in some firms out there that it's a lot mm -hmm. they the easy it's it's they i guess a lot nicer in terms of and there are some people out there that are willing to open the doors but i found that in the professional world it's a lot more harder i mean it's interesting like the bigger the bigger um bigger corporates have increasingly like they know about some of the issues and then they start, you know, DNI, diversity and inclusion committees and so on. Um, some of which are more successful than others and some of which, you know, um, I think are more effective than others. Um, and uh, so, you know, you see people recognizing the issues, but, um, you know, definitely in in the experience that, that we had, uh, you know, which is now a, a while ago, because we're now building our own kind of culture. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's definitely still a work in progress, I guess. Yeah. Um, and you still see things here and there where mm. where clearly, yeah, there's some systemic biases going on. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, and I suppose like we have different experiences as well. Um, there's this one funny story actually, where yeah, the firm we were out, they were trying to do this diversity thing, which is great. Um, it was kind of like an Asian, um, Asian Australian uh, diversity leadership thing, and. There was an initial email, like a expression of interest thing that went out to um, people who they identified as Asian. Um, and so they're like, hey, come to this meeting. And so I went to that meeting. Um, and then there were, you know, obviously people like me, East Asian background, there were some South Asian background people. Curiously, he wasn't there. <laughs> I wasn't invited. <laughs> um, which, I mean, I, I kind of knew why, but I just thought I'd ask, hey, um, how did you get this email list together. <laughs> and then they were like, yeah, look, um, there's, a, there's, there's a report by the Human Rights Commissioner and the Racial um, Commissioner that um, there's, a, there's a methodology of how to, how to do these things. And, you know, you basically, you look at um, a person's uh, surname and you also look at their photo <laughs> and then that's how you make that assessment. 
I'm like, that's that's exactly what's been happening to us all our life. You know, like the, the funny name and, and how you look. Yeah, and like with, with Alex, like, you know, his name's Solo. I mean, that's not, not yeah. a usual name, but it, it's not, also not like overly ethnic. And then, so that, I thought that was kind of funny. Yeah. Um, did, so um, did that get resolved or what? No, no, no. no, no, no. <laughs> I mean, so never, I don't yeah. think you would have gone anywhere. But I, I, find, I find those things yeah. funny as well. There's some experiences that we have, um, like there are positives to it as well when we get advantages. Racially, yeah. Yeah. So did you guys get any advantages of being like yeah. racially profiled? <laughs> I mean, like I, I've always loved being or my background. Like I've, I've haven't really felt that disadvantage like overtly which mm. i think it's a privilege like depending on what background you have and um there's other factors as well so yeah i, I i've i've always found it like a, i prefer what i am now than otherwise <laughs> yeah yeah because yeah. I, I think there's probably some connotations behind different east asians anything like you know again just stereotyping you but like you know japanese are considered to be obviously very you know sort of reliable and you know <laughs> you know like i'm not stereotyping you but, but it, it crosses people's minds right like i guess um and you know even sort of like being chinese myself i can see myself having a lot of advantages growing up mm. being that you know like people see me differently but even like i think about traveling we were just talking about travel before coming on like and sort of like an Asian traveling amongst mm. different countries, you have your advantages as well. So mm. I think um, there's always two sides of the coin with this sort of stuff yeah. as well. I, yeah. I don't know if you get this when you're traveling, but outside of Australia and maybe the US, no matter where I go, they treat me as a Japanese person. <laughs> like I would be like, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm from Australia. They're like, oh, you live there, but what's, what's this like in Japan? <laughs> Tell me more. They're like I've never lived Japanese in Japan. <laughs> That's so funny. Yeah. But yeah. did you get, you probably, you just got back from Europe, but. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think, and it's, so it's kind of weird. I've got like, you know, I'm, I'm um, kind of mixed background and then my surname is Solo. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, um, kind of touching on the story you had earlier. I mean, I do sometimes wonder if I get like name privilege or whatever it is, if you can call it that, like mm. solo. And also people are like, where's that guy from? When they look at me, they don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> and why is he That's called solo? <laughs> I reckon I got higher class participation marks at uni because they're just, I was memorable. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. And I feel like, I don't know, like you just never really know. You can't really measure this, but- You never I ask do, either, right? I, yeah. yeah, I mean, I do feel like even in business, like it's people tend to remember when I have meetings and it helps and helps keep. So there's weird things like that. I reckon, yeah. And I, I'll be honest, man. Like yeah. for the five years I known you, I didn't even think about like what race you were at all because it was just too confusing. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's what I'm saying. I didn't even bother. I was like, like oh, where do I start with this? Yeah. <laughs> just a question mark. Uh, yeah. That's so funny. Way too confusing. Yeah. To think so. um, but yeah, to, like to change gears as well, going back to obviously starting up Sprint Law as well. Um, can you sort of walk through the initial period, you know, sort of let's say the first year or two starting up the firm. Mm. So you, you, if I sort of walk back to, because I know we jumped all over the place, you guys had that, that conversation. There was that sort of like inflection point. And then you had to pitch to your dad mm -hmm. and your parents were like, oh, good, that's no problems, <laughs> right? And then, um, and then from there, it's like, well, you know, did you sort of slowly start Sprint Law and then quit? Or was it like a very clean cut? So what was that period like? Yeah, I've kind of forgot about this, but we we did just before we left, we did a accelerator, legal tech accelerator. We okay. did. I actually forgot about that. Yeah. Yes, yeah. we did do that. So, so, yeah, we're, memories, yeah. yeah, we're talking about all these lunchtime things. And then um, an op opportunity came up where... Um, there was a legal tech accelerator in Melbourne where they basically said anyone trying to start a law slash tech thing, apply and, you know, we'll give you funding if you win. It's like a competition slash three-day boot camp. Mm. And we just said, let's do it. Like this, let's just, this will be a good way to solidify our thoughts. So we did that, forced us to like build a pitch, flew to Melbourne and just actually worked on this for like wow. three days. And then we ended up winning this competition. Oh, and, oh. and then... Um, but then we were like, we don't want this. There was like, there were strings attached to the funding. We're like, we don't need this funding, but we've got a good business model now. Oh, and so, really? so that was actually the point at which we're like, we got a pitch, we got a, uh, got a plan. Um, and, and so we turned that down. And then I think that was like a month before, a month or two before. And we said, okay, let's hand in our resignations. Yeah. Let's go do this. Oh, yeah. wow. And the, the thing about like flying down to Melbourne, it was, it was in a weekday. Yep. And so we took leave. And I, I forgot about this, but, I remember that taking leave to do something did for you, I felt guilty at yeah, the time. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. did it feel wrong? Yeah, yeah. But, but like now, like it's crazy that, that that corporate environment forces you to think that way. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. 
but yeah, I, I, th- I think that was kind of telling us like, I don't want to be in this corporate environment. <laughs> so what <laughs> was it like during the accelerator, you were like, this is real. Like, oh, we have got something real going on here. Hmm. Was there anything in particular across the three days that you guys were like, yep. Yeah, the, the, the program was like very stock standard lean startup yep. type thing. Like you, you, you know, think about your beachhead market, the lemonade stand, like all those, you know, you've probably heard about all that. Mm. So we were kind of applying that methodology to what, what our idea was. And so it really refined um, our business in that way. And, yeah. and I think then getting that kind of reception from the, the people judging you know, on the judging panel Gave you the confidence. Yeah, I think we're like, yeah, we've definitely got something here. Okay. Yeah. And I think for me, I remember like, you know, the Lean Canvas is one of the Lean Startup tools. They make you define your problem, your solution, your value proposition, your market size, um, and and your go-to-market strategy and like the six kind of component, basic components of a business. And when we mapped all that out, again, you've got swirling ideas, you know, there's a problem with small businesses and blah, blah, blah. Swirling ideas all refined. And something as we've d- done more and more of the business, I've realized just how important articulation is like Mm -hmm. spending heaps of time refining your message actually improves your strategy and that was the first time that we took unstructured conversations refined them to a really tight we actually did a joint pitch which we haven't done since but it was like a Mm. i remember thomas saying at the time it's it's kind of like a jazz band playing where you know i'd say a slide he'd say a slide it was so tight and so efficient gave us this feeling of wow we got a really tight business model Mm. and we can really do this and then as thomas said this the positive feedback Confidence is a big thing. We're not just two people at lunchtime with an idea, but mm-hmm. we just want to pitch competition. Let's go do it. We can we can actually do it. So I think that was yeah probably the the the, the elements of the accelerator that helped. Yeah. So how did you build that confidence apart from like you know the uh, the judges? Like the, was it from the experience you had and also um, uh, working on clients that basically said, hey, you guys should go out on your own? Did they say stuff like that at all? Um, it's interesting. Like we didn't really have um hadn't actually worked with our target market all that much before we just kind of had researched them and as tommy mentioned hung out with them as part of the startup program i think we just had um in retrospect some night more naive confidence than confidence based on actual Mm. um actually really knowing that we're like we can do this like we've seen other people do stuff we Mm. think we can do it better like we'd we'd seen other people try and do stuff for small businesses and we're just like looking at what they're doing going we could do 40 times better than this Mm. so it's more that kind of self-confidence looking at competition i think more than like positive customer feedback where we really got if they can do it and we can reckon we can do it better let's just do it that's pretty much that simple i reckon i think that's quite important because uh uh, people tend to they tend to like stick on this idea and they they know it's a great idea but they just have this analysis uh, paralysis and where they just don't do anything at all and they just sit on it for so long yeah. and for me like and yourself and um tomo and, and can sometimes we just gotta just jump into it and believe yes. our gut and i think i didn't do any um uh like i didn't really have any clients because uh and worked on any clients and worked on this model that i had which is fixed fees monthly charge and mm. working on small businesses um and I couldn't because in the corporate world, you can't do that. It's very frowned upon if to, for, to have your own clients. Mm. So we just had to, you know, take a guess and jump at it. Mm. So it's, yeah, I think it's quite important to have that na- naive feeling and just jump right into it sometimes as well. It might work. This episode is produced and brought to you by Social Wave. Social Wave is a strategic content marketing agency helping businesses grow revenue using video, podcasts and SEO. Head on over to socialwave.com.au to find out more. Now back to the show. So how did you guys manage to grow? Like what your initial client base, how did you sort of start there? And where did you find like your first round of clients, so to speak? Yeah, I think the first few were people we knew and then we discovered Google. That's yes. basically <laughs> what happened. <laughs> yeah. As in Google ads, Google. SEO and that sort of stuff. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. I think we, we always knew we were going to do this like SEO strategy because we're like, well, legal is an industry where there was a study that came out in 2015 or 16 said 90% of small businesses are starting their search for a lawyer on Google, but 20% are finishing it, i.e. they end up going to friends and family. Mm. And the, the if you looked at law firm websites back then and even now, there's no surprise. Like you'd go to a law firm website and it looked like it was made in 1994. <laughs> yeah. And it would be like, we are equity capital market specialists <laughs> and, corp- and it's mm. terrible user experience. So we're like, there's everyone searching. We need to be there at the top. And, and so, um, so I think, um, 
our our focus on the website and targeting those searches and then which lead led uh, eventually to Google ads and SEO uh, is, is really where mm. it, it, it kind of um, clicked and we got started to get a bit of traction. Yeah. yeah. And like even now, you know, the design aspect, like they don't look like the websites are from 94, but like a lot of law, law firms haven't really utilized digital marketing mm. really. Like, I mean, you'd probably be horrified yeah. if you see- I see many firm, horrific law firm um, websites, but, but yeah. But, 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 but because they probably, they don't, acquire clients through that channel yes. it's, it's just a, an ad for them i think yep. whereas for us like we had to apply that discipline of um you know user journey and mm. uh, ctas and you know all those kind of things which um i think really like no one else is doing it so um, well i suppose yeah. if you wind it back if you think about the traditional sort of law partner pathway and not that i'm a lawyer expert or anything but i imagine you sort of do like your decades of trade and you do your time and then you eventually, you know, either buy into your partnership or you've got a big network. Like mm. I think the network size of things, and that's probably why you don't see maybe necessarily too many young sort of law partners, although there's probably more now. But I guess my point is, is that a lot of these guys build up their networks and it's word of mouth and mm. that's how they generally make their money. Whereas you guys, you know, sort of in your 20s, mm. didn't have that luxury. Very you true. had to find a new acquisition channel that's right. yeah. to be able to mm. do that. So it was almost by mm -hmm. circumstances that you had to find that that way. Oh, so you, you did exhaust your network, but like compared to a, someone who's been doing it for decades, yes. you, know, you didn't have that luxury, I imagine, yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's true. And also I think we have, you know, our model is about, we had a pretty big vision. And again, some of that comes from just um, youthful, um, dreaming and and some of it comes from just you know um real motivation to do so but in in our mind the concept of relying on referrals and word of mouth and personal networks is why the legal industry is so fragmented and no one's ever done this big scalable thing and we're like we we need to find a new acquisition channel we we have this big vision for sprint law i mean i, we, I again I, we used to talk about this years ago but we realized probably in the first six months of doing sprint law that we could just stop at like we could have stopped at six months, stopped growing and have a very profitable lifestyle business. And mm. both of us would be perfectly fine. Mm. And we were like, should we, do? and we both were like, no, nah, we're, we're here to build something big. And so again, that leads you to go, well, if we're here to build something big, we need something that can really, really scale big. Yeah, yeah. And, and hence um, relying on people, which is what traditional law firms have done. You know, it's got a, a cap at the, at, at the end of the an end of the tunnel. So yeah. yeah. I mean, Debbie and I talk about it all the time. We both run service businesses as well, mm. yeah. um, you know, um, human capital is the hardest thing to scale, mm, you indeed. know, as a business model as well. So we're, that's why we're so technology focused in terms of our businesses, but certainly not to the extent of you guys, I imagine. But um, the, I mean, the other thing going back to sort of like business partners and that sort of stuff, do you guys ever sort of um, curious to know? And cause I think it's always not always like roses and, you know, sort of like paintings on one side, but do you guys ever have run-ins with each other sort of growing this and arguments and, you know, you have beef, <laughs> but what's the sort of relationship been like growing the business? Um, we don't really like, we've developed a rhythm where the default is we're kind of criticizing each other's ideas. Okay. Yeah. And so, but then it's not personal really. It's just like, we want a better idea. So I think that we've kind of gotten used to that. And I think that's really important because like, um, and I don't know how you do it, Davey, but for us, like we make better he just decisions. He himself. Yeah. <laughs> Legit. And that's what I do. Yeah. Well, anyone that calls me, I'm like asking them like my idea, even if they, they're a client, I'm just talking to them about it. Yeah. What do yeah, you reckon? Yeah, keep going. Yeah, but, I mean, I, I think we make better decisions as a result because um, it's it's a, a sum of two peoples. And, yeah. and you got blind spots individually. Yeah, exactly, exactly yeah. 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 Do, do you ever like leave one person to lead the charge in certain topics? Yeah, or, how does your role yeah. split, I guess? I suppose that's yeah. the other thing I'm curious about. Um, the strengths and weaknesses of each other. So we kind of let that lead, I think. And then there's certain mm -hmm. functions within the business that we've separated, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think, yeah, like, um, you know, there's probably a discovery process, but we knew each other quite well before we started the business, which I think helps. You got a friendship, you know each other intimately. Um, and so we kind of knew what each other's strengths and weaknesses were. And then obviously in the business have discovered that more over time. And so I think again, when you have a second founder, it's like learning where they're strong and you're weak and, and going, well, I'm gonna rely on their judgment or default to their judgment in this situation. Um, I think we do that pretty well. Mm. I mean, for me, and um, when I first kind of met Tomo, I have a, um, a memory in, in our legal technology team, like being, going, wow, this guy is like a genius and he thinks in a way completely different to me. So, um, and, and, and that I think 
Um, and I, I, I actually founded a couple of other small companies with people that were um, maybe more, thought more similarly to how I did. And so when we collaborated, we may not debate, but I found that we didn't really add value to each other as much. Mm. Whereas when Tomo has a perspective, he will very frequently think about it in a way that I just don't at all. Mm. And I think that's why our partnership's pretty good because we both just probably respect each other, but just think differently. And that really helps this feeling of the, the sum of the parts is greater than the individual. Yeah, you know? I find that very unique because it's not very easy to find. Mm. Like I'm sure I've been doing accounting for a very long time and Still to this day, I haven't really found anyone that like that can um, compliment me. Mm -hmm. and, and not to sound like like up myself, I'm not like saying that at all. It's just that like people think I'm crazy sometimes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, yeah. And then they don't really they they want to take the a safe route, which most accountants do. Yes. And so like you know, 26 starting an accounting firm, they everyone's just like, what you're crazy? Like, mm -hmm. why would you do something like that? And it's hard, like, um, and some people, and that is a weakness of me as well. Like it's a strength and a weakness. So I have to say like what you guys have, that type of relationship is very hard to it's find. It's rare as it's well. Very hard. I, I, yeah. You know, the classic uh, advice is don't go into business with your friends because mm. you could, you know, just lose your relationship at the same time. Mm. But you guys have figured out a way to work with that. Um, mm. And I think hearing from what you're saying, I would say, you know, you, you both probably have strong opinions held loosely yes. in the sense that if, one of you seems to have a better point all of a sudden you're like well i'm not gonna be stubborn about it like or you know you got a healthy respect between each other and then you're able to sort of move forward with whoever's got the better idea that you sort of had a unanimous decision where i find sometimes with business partnerships oftentimes it just becomes an ego issue mm -hmm. as opposed to uh is it for the business is it for the right reasons so um i think that's really important that's why i sort of wanted to ask that question because i think um, a lot of people think it's a great idea to go into business with their friends because mm. it's all it's all great until it sort of shit hits the fan. Um, <laughs> it, it hits the fan a lot. Yeah. And, yeah. and speaking of shit hitting the fan, has shit hit the fan? <laughs> yeah. And, and if so, like, what's that been like and how did you guys sort of work through that? Between the two of us, I don't think we've ever had a significant problem. Um, and, um, you know, I think... You, maybe it's a, so I, I think it's interesting because I have many friends like you, Davey, who are running businesses by themselves and couldn't dream of working with someone else mm. and they're very successful. Mm. And so I think it's not, there's clearly many different ways to make the whole thing work. Like you don't need a partnership. Um, but for our personality types, maybe it's, mm. I haven't, never, haven't analyzed in heaps of detail, but maybe we're both lawyers legally trained at the beginning of our mm. career. So we're, we're comfortable with the idea of fierce argument and debate. And so, it's easy to do what Tomo said earlier, which is debate without it getting personal. Hence, it's very difficult to have a blow up when you, we argue all the time, but it's never personal. So when, when is it gonna become personal? Like it just doesn't really. Mm -hmm. And we've worked out a way to make it not personal. And so it doesn't really lead to problems. I do think another important thing we did pretty early on was very clearly define, and it switched as we've grown obviously, but very clearly define areas or departments of the business we'd be responsible for. So there's never, um, Tomo and I are both making a decision about a particular area because then you just, we would definitely make different decisions if given the same problem. Mm. Um, but that doesn't matter because uh, we don't, we're not responsible for doing that. Like we make strategic decisions as a business together through debate, but day-to-day -day quick decision-making is Tomo manages an area, I manage an area and we just do it autonomously. And so mm. again, you're not crossing wires. So I think some of these structures have prevented any real issues. And then again, I think, you know, in the probably it's like a, in the first few years of a relationship, it, it's probably more likely to be rockier. But at this point, this many years in, it's like, it would just be weird to have a fight. Like, which is, <laughs> it's just like, it's so, it'd be so odd because it just never yeah. happened. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I think, um, I, I sort of love the honesty of the answers because I think sometimes when people sit in the podcast, um, you ask them those sort of questions and they feel like obliged to say, oh, we have had shit hit the fan. Yes. But it's actually nice to hear also that you're like, no, it's been it's been good. Yeah. Um, because uh, sometimes people like the sort of the drama, the Hollywood of, you know, yeah. running businesses is too much Harvey Specter and suits and that sort of stuff. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I mean, the other thing that sort of comes to mind, and again, it may not even be a problem is, you know, when you guys, you know, when you started, you're quite obviously still young. Um, did you have any run-ins with sort of people taking you guys seriously um, starting the business, whether it's like sort of, um, you know, pitching to people, clients, what have you, just in general, you know, they're like, oh, these guys are just having fun. <laughs> you tell, know, tell, like, I, I can oh, see Alex. Oh, like, yeah, he, yeah, tell me. See a story, you got a few yeah. stories. I'm it's sure. kind of weird because maybe that's diminished in the last couple of years, but definitely first 
first of all, like small businesses, you're online and you're not old and you're a lawyer. It's like, yeah. this doesn't tick any box of what I thought I would be dealing with. <laughs> so early days, initial traction, lots of clients are like, eh, how old? Like you get questions like, how old are you? And stuff like that. <laughs> um, it, probably in the, again, early days in the recruitment process, you know, lawyers, recruiting lawyers, it's like this age thing, which, um, you know, in the recruitment process where like we, some lawyers I think would be uncomfortable working for us because we were younger than them, some some types of people. So definitely face that. A lot of this stuff becomes easier when your brand is known and then mm. now, these days probably not as much of an issue and we're just a bit older. Mm. Um, and then also uh, just massive skepticism from everyone we were working with who was like, no, you have to be a lawyer for 12 years, then you become a partner. <laughs> what are you guys doing? Like, you can't. Yeah. I don't know if you have any other stories like that, Tomo, but yeah, I just remember all those things very clearly. Yeah, I've, I've kind of forgotten all that, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. you, um, you, you have this innate ability, <laughs> like, just forget yeah, about like, it. Anything that's negative, right? Like, now it's good. Like, yeah. people actually take, like, we're a bit more known and, and um, we haven't had those issues recently, so. Mm. I, I still remember a time where someone decided to work for me. I, I was so happy. Like mm. I, I, it was so, so you hard. you want to work for me? <laughs> yeah, like it was so hard to convince that one person to take the leap and join like, you know, my idea that I had. Mm. So like, I, I know how you feel completely. Mm. Um, but for me, it was actually a lot of fun when I could convince someone to sign on as a client or, you know, come yeah. on as a um, employee. Um, I remember the first time where I jumped into a room with some guy that was twice my age and he was like looking me up and down and the only reason why he even gave me that chance to even have a meeting with him was because my my old uh my old boss he's retired he brought me in and said that you got to speak to davy because <laughs> this guy knows what he's doing and he's like he can take care of you definitely and he sat me down and asked me all these questions and then after asking me all these questions he's like yeah this guy knows what he's talking about and then from like after him signing that like dotted line that he's going to become a client i just felt so bloody amazing mm. um yeah for me i just yeah and i know you didn't ask me that question i answered it anyway but uh, well, we just <laughs> talked about this a lot anyway yeah. ourselves but i think um certainly yeah. i think um ageism from a you know the law firm i imagine is a is probably an issue um if if at all if you call it that but um probably less so in marketing just because Every 21 year old seems to be a marketer as well. So, um, you know, a little bit different, but- uh, Well, one yeah. of the things I like about marketing and even the, the agency land um, is that a lot of the way that marketing agencies or creative agencies seem to work is a big value of youth. And the youth are often where the ideas come from. And as you yep. get more senior, you actually go more into the strategic business side, but there's a lot of like, okay, younger people actually know what's happening and how to grab attention. Mm. And um, one of the frustrations in the, traditional law environment that we saw was that there were all these great ideas about law mm. uh you know coming from the younger generation of lawyers but the more experienced ones um were just the structures were not set up to value those ideas so they were like no you may think you have ideas but you don't know anything <laughs> i once too thought i had ideas but then i became experienced mm. and they were all wrong and it's like no they just became irrelevant because you didn't do anything at the time right so i think I like that about the mm. marketing um, industry. I mean, obviously that's, there's, there's nuance in different places, but we thought about that as well at the beginning, like, and even now in our model is very much like, well, what are the, uh, you know, youngest or, you know, people in our company, um, you know, what, what's happening now, particularly with like things like marketing and what do we need to, we, we really don't want to become dinosaurs ourselves yeah. in yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. I, I think, you know, even, you know, I say to my clients, I think we shouldn't be, um, romantic about what got us to a certain point in time, particularly with marketing, because marketing is a very dynamic thing. It's definitely not static, as you guys know. Mm. I mean, you can probably certainly see, not to make this a marketing conversation, but, you know, the, the cost of acquisition for, you know, Google ads, you yeah. know, it's just going through the roof. Mm. So you have to reinvent yourself constantly as a business, right? Mm. Um, and you guys have ambitious plans to sort of grow and scale to, a, you know, a, a fairly large size. So are you able to sort of um, share sort of what's the actual goal for Sprint Law? Because like, if we sort of set where you guys are at now, you know, in terms of like head, how many staff you have, you obviously just expanded to the UK as well, or recently expanded to the UK. Sort of what's the grand plan for you guys and where are you at now? Big visions. How many people do we have at the moment? Around 50, yeah. 50 mm -hmm. or something. I think we're, um, we just really want to keep growing. And I think like the problem that we know is that small businesses, you know, don't have easy access to legal services. Uh, it's a headache, it's time consuming, it's expensive. Mm -hmm. 
and that's the result of a super fragmented industry with lots of these boutique um, more, more suburban firms and we just think that we want to be the the place if you're a small business just you go to sprint law like mm. we are the people that you would go to and that applies we've been discovering as we've I've grown the business not just in australia but in other markets too where we can take what we've done and uh, you know in the uk where we've recently launched and other markets that we're looking at same dynamics are at play so the same problem exists in multiple places so i think um we are a uh, tech but also service business so we we can't you know there's what two million small businesses in australia um we can't snap our fingers and service all of them tomorrow um and and you know the, the size we would have to be to do that in the current model is very large but as much as we can we just want to get bigger and bigger and help more and more of them and have a place or a home for them to go when they need legal services yeah. and so i think we're, we're just planning on growing for now and seeing where it goes and you know the uk business is um fledgling compared to australia but growing mm. super super fast so yeah. a lot of focus on that right now and but Australia's still growing too. So, you know, mm. just growth is my answer to the yeah, question. Growth, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. so has growth changed um, your business at all? Like, because it, I, I know for me, like growing pains has caused a lot of things mm. in my business that thought worked back then, but doesn't work anymore. Mm. Yes. I'm, I'm interested in the, like the stuff that you evolved from. Yeah. I mean, one of the things we always tell our staff is that because we want to grow, whatever we build today, um, will be hopeless tomorrow. So you have to keep reinventing mm. the, the systems and, and, and the processes. Um, and so yeah, we definitely had our share of growth pains. In fact, we're, we're you know, cleaning up some of them right now. <laughs> <laughs> tell, me, tell me more about those growth pains though. I'm actually curious. Come on, um, you want to vent your frustrations. <laughs> yeah. That's a good, good example. Well, I mean, I saw a, a picture which we, we ended up sharing with the company, which yes, 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 there's yeah. like a, you can picture like a, the exponential cur curve, which every startup wants. They want the company to grow like that. Mm. It's like, um, you know what you want to happen and then how, what it actually looks like and it's like and definitely as we're growing you have these spurts of growth and then yeah all your systems break down or like you've hired so many people and then you're worried about your culture or um your processes aren't up to scratch or the market shifts all of a sudden mm. um, and we definitely had like last 12 months up to end of financial year that just happened we grew more than I think we ever have in a 12 month period. I mean, de depending how you define percentage terms, but but we grew a lot um, and that was exciting, but also a lot of our systems were breaking down. Our IT systems started breaking down, our team structures. Um, we had to reformat them in the middle of growing and then we didn't have time to let them settle because more people are starting. And so, mm. um, you know, we started to see inefficiencies emerge and we basically are like, okay, well, these systems that worked at phase one of growth, as you said, Davey, don't work at phase two. Mm. Um, and then it, I think it's so interesting because like we've got the UK business as well, which is at a different scale to our Australian business. If we tried to roll out the phase two Australian systems on a phase one, it's like too complicated for where it's at. So um, you kind of got to recognize those inflection points and when the size and scale is ready for your systems. And I think in the early days, we thought we would have to build for scale from the beginning. Um, but I actually think you need to recognize that different systems work for different scales. And so you should build for phases, but not necessarily forever. Mm -hmm. um, you need to be able to evolve because when, but who knows when you get to the next phase of growth and at that time you can solve the problem of the system, but this one needs to last you for at least this phase. So yeah, we're going through a process, um, kind of mostly on the other side of it, but of, of like slowing down growth a bit and just focusing on systems before we kick up the engine again. Mm. Um, and I think that's been really important to do because otherwise it can just get out of control and everything mm. will break and you lose what was special about you if you if you don't don't think that way. Yeah, it's like sort of losing control behind the wheel type thing. Yes. So then when you sort of with the UK situation at the moment, are you finding um, what helped you with the growth in Australia been really um, helpful for the UK expansion or has it been that the market's you know quite different or the way things operate there is quite different how's that been in terms of comparing you know same stages mm. um with uk versus australia mostly similar which is why we picked picked that market i think the legal systems english common law mm -hmm. um and the market dynamics are relatively similar uh, i would say maybe there's slight slightly more um respect in society in England for, for, for lawyers, which brings up your conversion rates from lead to, lead to sale. Yeah. Don't know if that's the reason, but we're, we're definitely seeing a bit of that. Um, on the other hand, the time zone makes it difficult to manage from Australia. So we're still coping with some, mm. some issues around that. But I think um, 
uh, we have a, a, a team there that's um, growing, just getting better and better. And we're, we're working out, I think the big thing to work out is how much do you copy and paste your Australian system and how much do you tweak for the market? And that you never know until you're there and you're testing. Um, the principle is uh, you've got something great in Australia, try and keep it as much as you can. Um, but ultimately, if it needs to change for the market, it does. So, um, you know, I think we've been going through a process of working out where the line is um, and finding more and more that the more similar you keep it to the thing that works in Australia, the more successful it is. If we do another country, uh, you know, we'll have some learnings from this one. But again, the UK now is the growth rate of the UK is much, much higher than Australia. Mm. So it's like definitely an exciting portion of the business because um, it's smaller, but we have five years of learnings from Australia on how to grow. We don't have to learn the same things again. Mm. And that's super cool to see. I mean, we got in a year growth in the UK that took us maybe three and a half years in yeah. Australia to get wow. to. So you just, wow. you just see. You have all the answers. But like, is it, is it because, yeah, you've, you've made the mistakes before, you knew what the, the correct yeah. path to go through? But, but also like when, when it's the first time doing it, you, I mean, they're mistakes, but also you kind of don't really know what, what you're meant to do. Mm. And so you, you waste a lot of time doing things that don't work, um, not necessarily mistakes, but then when you kind of have the answers, you just implement it, you cut just so much time. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Wow. And then, um, no, yeah, sorry, I wanted to jump in. What, what were the things that you realized that were kind of useless or you shouldn't have jumped into and you learned from? Sure, there's many. Was, yeah, was, was it employees or yeah. processes? In yeah, but tech maybe some tech that you tried to jump into. Yeah, I mean, the tech is good. Like, as we, we build all these applications that we use internally, we've built a lot that never went anywhere. But the ones that we use in Australia, we just roll out, you know, straight away. That, that's a good example. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Or like how to sell, like, um, you know, when you're selling legal services, and you would probably have a similar thing with accounting. It's um, technical. A bit so how much how much tech technical knowledge do you bring in at the early stages and how much do you put in the back end mm. and we tried five different versions of that you know giving our team tons of legal training versus giving them no legal training or somewhere in the middle and then working out what they need to know to actually onboard a new client working out where that mix sits that took years in australia yeah. and um and mm. but is mostly settled now mm. so in the uk you just go okay well this is how we do it and and you just skip the whole process of, of of trying and your training becomes way better and more accurate you don't over train or under train um so yeah that's it that's another yeah, example yeah. I've, yeah. I've got a very specific example um so when we first started on our website we had like a 15 questionnaire type form yeah and we were we thought we were genius and we were like oh we're gonna <laughs> cut the you know cut the time of being on the phone and the clients will give us the answers um what we found out was that um people were dropping off at question two <laughs> <laughs> and so you know now we just have a simple and this is you know from a marketing perspective mm -hmm. probably makes sense mm -hmm. but we were just you know dumb lawyers thinking that <laughs> we're, gonna, we're gonna automate um, <laughs> more but you know now we've got a form which is you know really geared towards conversion rates and you know, we didn't even think about doing a 15 question thing on our website in the uk mm -hmm. you know, mm. yeah that kind of thing like this there's, there's so many of those examples yeah yeah. You no, no, no. I'm good. Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to say, I was like, I mean, these are sort of, you wouldn't say learn mistakes, but just sort of learnings um, through the process of experimentation and trial and error that, you know, you try this stuff. And I think um, a lot of people aim for perfection first. Mm. Um, and it sounds like, especially with the speed and rate of growth that you guys are going through, a lot of it is, you know, do and then see and then um, sort of analyze. And, you know, obviously you're going to have your hypothesis to start off with. But I think like going back to what Davey was saying, there's a lot of analysis paralysis with people when trying to make decisions in business. And they also end up taking too long to make decisions. Mm. Like I know friends right now who, you know, are trying to start their businesses and they're eight months in, they're still trying to figure out what the website looks like. Yeah. You know, and I think these are yeah. sort of the examples that I think about because we, we make decisions fairly quickly. Mm. I think too many of us is it's because number one, we've probably gone through the process of making those mistakes. I know there's many years where Davey and I were talking about the next big thing and never started yeah. <laughs> right like it's always same thing we'd have lunches together but it's, um, it's also important to just throw yourself in the deep end and make the mistake yes. right because like i remember my accountants when i hired a uh when i hired for sales i hired a sales guy and i hired a accountant that was a junior that didn't have much experience in sales at all mm. and then um why don't you just hire a senior accountant that's it um, or why didn't you just hire a, a, a junior accountant and that's it? Or why not just hire sales? But I said, no, let's just hire all of them and then we'll see how it goes. Mm. And do you know what? I worked out, they both work. 
yeah they both work yeah. it's just the different special ways mm-hmm. and it's it's and i learned so much from this one and i learned so much from this one so you just got to try it and yes. you give it a go and that's i think the difference between um you know startups and like you know the traditional firms it's like the they, agility behind yeah, it right we just jump right into it we don't really care and we want to learn from it rather than saying no this is the only way there's only one way to doing it yeah yeah no, i think like yeah, like I don't know that if there is any like magic bullet to entrepreneurship, but if there was one, I think it'd be what you guys were just saying, which mm. is um, throwing yourself in the deep end straight away mm. is how you get things done quickly. If you overthink it and over plan, you're just wasting time pontific- pontificating. Just try and just do it and then you'll see what happens. And then next and then next and then next and then you actually build a business. Yeah. Um, well, I, I remember like Tomo and I in the early days would spend a long time debating, um, should we do this, should we do that? Once we made our first sale, you know, that everything falls into place. Cause it's like, don't waste time setting up your bank account and all this stuff, just sell something to someone. Now you got to deliver it. Oh man, now I need to set up a bank account so I can get their money. Oh man, now I need to set up an IT system so I can record it. Everything will, will happen. Just sell and just work it out. And I think that's like similar to what you're saying. It's like yeah. such a key and that's the analysis paralysis is probably the biggest barrier to people doing stuff. Yeah. Mm. You want to mention yeah. something? Oh, except the, the first thing we did, um, being lawyers, was to uh, register a trademark. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that's right. That is true. But um, and you should definitely do that. <laughs> that, that. You should definitely do that. Yeah. Most people don't. You know. Well, actually, it's good advice. I still, <laughs> I still, I still, I still have a trademark. We'll we should probably talk it. after this. Yes. Um, yes. But cut that out, yeah. Don't yeah. <laughs> So I was going to steal it. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's what I was saying. Yeah. 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 I just did not put that on this episode. Guys, not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I mean, what, what else do you guys sort of credit towards, uh, you know, if you sort of list a, a few things about, you were like, look, if you're going to give advice to, you know, someone who might be starting out, you know, a similar law firm, maybe a competitor, maybe not, but like, you know, they, they sort of have similar aspirations, you know, and you, we were to mentor them. What sort of advice would you guys give them? We'll start with Alex. Come, come work at Sprint Law. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, it's interesting. So like, yeah, if, if, if you want to, um, if you're a lawyer, I think it's like um, certainly there's a lot of what would happen during university is that, that you would be, be, be told that there's one or two pathways. You either have to go, you know, work in criminal law or be a corporate lawyer and do your time and blah, blah, blah. I think right now we're seeing so many more pathways open up and, inside law and outside law. So speak widely to lots of people and and um, and make sure, you know, not all lawyers have to be cut from a certain cloth and, and work in a certain way. Um, all the people that work at Sprint Law are completely different to people that work in corporates and, and we have a very mm-hmm. different culture and vibe and people that um, m- may not fit in there would excel with us and vice versa. So I think um, it's important to find a place that kind of fits with what you want to do. Um, and the other thing I think I'd say is uh, this is more just about, um, you know, networking and, 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 and how to approach that, you know, and you guys have probably found this too, but um, when you're a kind of younger lawyer, you, um, the industry is so hierarchical and traditional, you think you need to go speak to the old partners and people with the old networks and impress them. And that's what networking is and so on. I think like what we found is like the people around us, all of our friends and people we went to university with or high school with or whatever it is, or just people that we've met that are in the same boat as us. Those people are the people that you really want to know because now that we're in our thirties and as we get older, it'll be more so these people know stuff and they're, they're the people where ideas and, and cool mm-hmm. things come from. And, and that becomes the network that you grow up with. And I think, um, uh, we did a bit of that, but I wish I did more of that when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Um, and if people are doing more of that, it's only going to be good. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's one of those things like people tell you at the time and you, you're you like, yeah, yeah, I'll do it. But then you, you don't. Yeah. And, it, and it's so many of those things, I think. Listen listen to people, I think, who have uh, wise things to say. Like just keep an open mind. Um, talk to as many people as much as possible. They, they all have different biases and different um, perspectives. Um, and then you just kind of amalgamate it and make your own i think and i guess in terms of you know to wrap it up uh, goals for sprint i know you said you want to just grow but you know we talk about expansion you know we seem to other markets and that sort of stuff you guys just purely focus on the uk what's sort of the plan over the next few years no we want to go to um new zealand we're looking at canada south africa a bunch of other places maybe the us eventually like we Mm. we want to go global that's a big part of the strategy right now Mm. and then keep growing and the 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 thing is finding the right growth rate like um you know how how fast do we do it but i think the plan is to go you know 
increased by two times if we can at mm. maximum each each year or um, you know, in some phases when that's too fast, we may do a little bit slower and as we get bigger, that gets harder to do, but really just keep growing and, you know, upwards and then expanding to, to, to a few other, other places as well. I think the one thing for us is, you know, people often talk about the big vision from day one that people mm. might have for their business. And the reality of that is, um, you know, as any entrepreneur will really tell you that the vision changes so off, so much as you grow. And yep. I think what we thought we might do in 2017 to what we are doing now, to what we'll think in two years is going to be different. Like three years ago, we weren't really thinking about international, but then COVID happened. We launched in UK. It, it so much excitement from that launch. Now global is what I'm telling you. But mm. um, I think we both have quite an open mind to what the future looks like. Ultimately, if if we can keep growing and working towards this vision and enjoying it and having a great satisfying business we're probably both going to be happy so mm. yeah. so it's not about the destination but the journey yeah to some yeah. extent 100%. that's beautiful or, or sometimes you get to the destination very quickly <laughs> yeah. right you yeah. kind of get there and you're like okay what, what's next what, what next exactly yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. and then you start to think bigger because like you said you sort of hit that you know lifestyle business and you know maybe that was the initial initial aspiration like oh we run our own business this mm. is all chummy except you thought oh maybe this will take this amount of time and all of a sudden you did that in a fraction of that time as well yeah so i think a lot of that happens i think you know dave and i talk about it as well mm. um even with like social wave we sort of grew incredibly quickly over the last two years and i remember sort of like a year in i was like oh kind of made what i wanted to make <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right and then you reassess and then you go right do i want to stay in that holding pattern or do i want to keep going Go obviously on. you guys are growth focused as well or do so. i want to start a podcast and- <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, this is a, this is literally this, you know the sort of the baby that was born as a result of it but um love it yeah i mean look obviously any other sort of parting words or any sort of advice or anything you guys wanted to share i guess before we wrap up anything parting words um <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to yeah yeah, I don't know. What, 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 what we've said a lot of things um, of various interests. Mm. I don't know. Maybe just um, join Sprint Law. Yeah, join Sprint Law. That's the thing. <laughs> We're hiring. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. How do you join Sprint Law? Um, you go through a very competitive process because <laughs> they're so popular. <laughs> yeah. uh, we do have a, a recruitment. Yeah, yeah. We, I mean, we've got ads up all the time um, on LinkedIn and other places. Um, mm-hmm. Or if you. Um, Often I find like um, when I was younger, I never did this, but you just cold email someone and like yep. mm. you don't do it because you think like who's going to read it, but actually you read them. Yes. Yeah. And some of our best employees have come through cold emails. Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah. I mean, I will add to that. I mean, I sort of felt over the last, you know, since starting the business, but particularly over the last 12 months, partly because you had a bit more confidence after the business got to a certain size was the whole adage of like, if you don't ask, you don't get. Yeah, yeah, And for sure. uh, I could probably credit a lot of, you know, the clients that we now work with and the staff and that sort of stuff through just going, fuck it, if they don't read it, yeah. who cares? But give it a shot. Give it a shot. So I think sometimes we shoot ourselves down before we even make the mm. attempt as well, right? Um, but yeah. Oh, I'm just laughing at the story that I told you this morning where last year I messaged one, someone, called a cold message, a cold email, and they rejected me. And then today, the CEO messaged me and they wanted to catch up. And I'm like, oh my God, it feels so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told you so. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they rejected me. I felt so terrible about it. I was like, oh man, I thought we could have had some good synergy and work together. Oh, well, who cares? And then next year, which is today's date, they, the CEO of the company, a major company, messaged me back. Yes. And, and I told him, hey, thanks for messaging me. I really appreciate it. Um, just to let you know, I messaged you like a year ago. Like, like I messaged Seriously. one of your guys. He's like, oh, really? Who, who is it? Who was it? <laughs> so That's just, so I'm, funny. Oh, no, the best experience I, ever. I have, so, yeah, yeah, I got quite a few stories like that, actually. I reckon like one of the things is like, I reckon all the best pieces of advice or knowledge I've gotten have come from things like that where you email someone either cold or whatever and you just meet even when you i don't remember if you emailed me or i, I, I messaged you, you messaged me blue. and we yeah. met and i still remember some of what we talked about because you gave me a bunch of ideas about marketing and probably vice versa mm. like that's better knowledge sharing than you're going to get from reading anything online mm. so mm. so much opportunities come from just stuff like that i, I reckon pe- people just need to do it more yeah. I know, they need, and don't worry about the rejection because one day next year 
the person higher up might be messaging you like what yes, happened exactly <laughs> undercover boss oh it's so good anyway um but yeah look obviously you know if besides anyone who wants to apply for a job but if they if they wanted to sort of find more about you know sprint law um, or even with you guys specifically you know what's the best way to connect with you guys yeah um our website sprintlaw.com.au we're both on linkedin probably the best place to find us um I think there's only one Tomoyuki Hachiro. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few Alex Solos. Actually. There's a, uh, there is actually, yeah. I, weirdly. You connected I, with one recently. I met, <laughs> I met, I'm not lying. This is a true story. I was in the UK and I met, I've had a, you know, when Facebook first came out in 07, people were like adding people with the same name. I added a dude called Alex Solo in the UK. <laughs> also like a musician background guy. And we've just been friends and followed each other's lives from a distance. <laughs> and he saw I was in the UK, lives in London. He's like, want to meet up? So I'm like, yep. He's not a lawyer too, <laughs> He's is he? not a lawyer. Oh, okay. He's just, he's same age. Just met this guy called Alex Solo and the two of us had a beer and had a chat and now we're friends and it was awesome. <laughs> right. Well, I'm going to, I'm wait for the day when I have meet another Ken Huang, but I haven't met one yet. So <laughs> Got I think that's still a little bit difficult, but yeah. um, obviously the last thing was obviously you guys are both musos as well. Mm, so do you yes. want to sort of share the handles for, you know, your music stuff as well? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. It's um, yeah, t- Tongaku251, T-O-N-G-A-K-U-251. Yep. Yep. Okay, cool. And then yours? Uh, well, I've got a band called Dream City, so you can check out Dream City's band. Mm. Check out some cool music. Nice. And um, yeah, Spotify. Awesome. Well, have, nice to have you guys on the show and thanks for coming on. Thanks, for coming thanks on. guys. Thank Great chat. Thanks for listening to the Level Asian Podcast. Make sure you subscribe and leave us a five-star review if you enjoyed the episode. And why not share it with friends and family who might enjoy it too? Also, make sure you head over to levelasianpodcast.com to join our email list and to receive the latest updates and get notified when the next episode drops. If you know a great guest we should feature, email us at contact at levelasianpodcast.com or DM us on our socials in the show notes. Catch you on the next episode.